You know, we make mistakes, but you're trying hard. You're doing your best, right? I am. You are right. We're, we know we're, we're doing the best we can, but nobody's perfect, and we mess up. And I just want somebody to say, you know, it's okay. And God doesn't say that. Uh, the, the singer Pink has written an anthem for our generation in this way. She's, and I think her intentions are, are, are good. She sees people being pressured to conform to standards and how you can't ever measure up to what everybody else expects you to be. So she sings in her inspirational song, Perfect. She says, pretty, pretty, please. Don't you ever, ever feel like you're less than perfect. Pretty, pretty, please. If you ever feel like you're nothing, you're perfect to me. And we hear that, God, that feels so good. That's what I want to hear. I want to know I'm okay. But then we come before the holiness of God. And you're not okay. You're not okay. You're, you're, you're deeply broken. I'm deeply broken and we're sinful. And, and there's sins that we excuse and we gloss over and we want to just minimize and say, you know, to the air is human and, and doing the best we can. We gloss over and all of our excuses and all of our cover-ups just fall before the holiness of God. It's an x-ray. It's a light that just cuts right through us. And, and, and so what do we do with that? How do we stand before a God like this? Well, that's David's problem. That's our problem. How can I, a sinful creature, ever hope to live before a God who is holy? Am I forever condemned to be on the outside? Is there any hope for being in his presence? Let's look at our last point, the path to God's presence. The path to God's presence. When David sees what happens to us, and he says, how can the ark ever come to me? He goes back to Jerusalem and he leaves the ark where it is. And, and he says, this, this is no way. I, I, can't, I can't go before God like this. If Uzzah just touches the ark and is dead, what do you think is going to happen to the rest of us? And so, so he, he just goes back and, and he stays there in Jerusalem. But, but God blesses Obed-Edom. And he sees that. And we'll, we'll finish up the rest of that next week, what, what happens. But here, we see what David does is what we all try to do. We're confronted with the holiness of God that exposes us in our sin, and that exposure is painful and ultimately deadly. And so what do we want? I don't want to be exposed. I don't want to be said to be a sinner. I want someone to say I'm okay. So the only way I can do that is I've got to avoid God or I've got to cover up. And so I've got to start putting God at a distance. And so, so what the best thing to do is leave the ark where it is, go home, you know, worship God from a distance, but let's not get too close. Uh, I, I can't have that intimate relationship with God. And that's what we do. We, we keep God at a distance. Don't open up your heart. Maybe, maybe even try and cover up some of your sin with some good works and really try hard to be good and avoid doing things that are bad. And, and that way we can kind of, kind of whitewash, gloss over our sins so maybe, maybe God's holiness won't quite penetrate to the depths of our heart. And that's what we do. We, we build walls. We build walls of just running away and say, forget all, God altogether. We build walls of religiosity. You know, um, there's some people... You can even use knowledge of Bible, knowledge of theology, as a way to hide from God. Now here's the interesting thing. You can't get to know God without theology. That's what theology is, right? You can't get to know God without the Bible, without revelation. But you can actually get to know theology and know the Bible and not know God. That's very possible. I'm Presbyterian. Trust me on that one. <laughs> and so you can do it. You can do it. And we want to hide from God. We want to keep him at a distance. We're afraid to get close. We're afraid to get close to one another because if I get close to you, you're going to see my sin. And so, so the best thing to do is <coughs> let's come together. And because we all know we're sinners, I'm going to tell you I'm a sinner. And uh, but I'm only going to tell you the sin I want you to know, right? One of our uh, first service, he, he, he always says that to me because I you know, appreciate how you're so open and honest about your sin. And I just got to chuckle. Because like, you really think I'm telling you my deep stuff? I'm just telling you that <laughs> that's all we're doing here, right? You know? And that's what we do. And so we come, we gloss over, we put on the clothes, smile, how you doing? Oh, better than I deserve, but we're not going to tell you why that's true. And, uh, and we keep God at a distance, and we keep one another at a distance. You know, I talk to, to men quite often, 
And, uh, and, and men uh, in our day and age bear a lot of shame, a lot of shame. And usually it centers around one issue. I bet you can guess. Pornography. Anybody brave enough to guess? Pornography. And there's a woman brave enough to guess what men's issue is, so thank you. Uh, and, uh, and it is. And, 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 and just struggling and struggling with it, and they're so full of shame. And so what do they do? They say, I got this, I can't let anybody find out. So they withdraw from community more, they keep God at a distance, and they say, I'm, I'm on the outskirts. Talk to women, women who, who are just so depressed because they can't be the mom and the wife that they can feel like they ought to be. And they look at themselves and they're, 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 they're just so full of guilt and shame because they struggle with their failures. Get together with men who are my age. Men who are my age. Uh, the, the issue that they often struggle with is their regrets of how they failed as parents. And, I mean, it, it, it just, they're, they're full of that regret. And what it does, it just causes you to say, I just want to stay away. I'm not going to let people close because they're going to see that. And I'm certainly not going to get close to God. And we condemn ourselves to a life where God is in it somewhere, but not in the center. Because we're too ashamed to draw near. We're too afraid to draw near the holiness of God because we know that God is holy. And like Uzzah, if we draw too close, we will be struck dead. So what's the hope for us in that one? Well, here's the hope. If you trace the story of God's presence with God's people, we come to the New Testament, we open up the Gospel of Matthew, and the Gospel of Matthew opens with these words. Jesus Christ, the Son of David, the Son of Abraham. Making this connection that Jesus is the very Son of David, the one who keeps God at a distance. But then he goes on. And in that first chapter of Matthew, when Joseph learns that Jesus is going to be born, the angel says, and his name shall be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. The Gospel of John in this first chapter makes this point even more clear when it says that, that Jesus came and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And that word for dwelt is the word for tabernacle, the place where the ark was. And so now Christ is dwelling among us, what we've wanted, what, you know, why the Israelites are celebrating, but now we've got a problem. How, still, God is here, he's among us, but how can he live among us without us being destroyed? Well, now you skip to the last chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, or second to last chapter, and also uh, uh, Mark and Luke as well. And we read that when Jesus was crucified, at the moment of his death, right there as he's about to breathe his last, that in the temple, the curtain was torn from top to bottom. Now that's significant when it says it was torn from top to bottom because if a person had torn it, it'd be torn from the bottom to top. And it was very high up. And so no one could get up there. It was torn from top to bottom. Now that curtain is a special curtain because that curtain was in the temple. And in the temple was a special room called the Holy of Holies. And then the Holy of Holies was where the Ark of the Covenant was. And no one could go into the Ark of the Covenant except for the high priest and only once a year. And the curtain was there to keep everybody out. And it was not there to protect the Ark from us. It was to protect us from the Ark. Because if you touch the Ark, you're going to die. If you look days upon the Ark, you're going to die. We cannot go into the, to the Holy of Holies because if we do, we will be killed. And yet, at the moment of Jesus' death, the curtain was torn. What is God saying? He's saying, draw near Come close. You who've been afraid of my presence can now come near. Why? Because on the cross, Jesus has taken our guilt and our shame. And because Jesus has taken our guilt and our shame, we can now draw near. See, in, in Samuel, Uzzah touches the ark and he dies. In the gospel, we, we touch the ark, but Jesus dies. The judgment of Uzzah came upon him so that the blessings might come upon us. We get the blessing of God's presence. Christ took the judgment. Here's the, the amazing thing. Sin is like a contagion. And you know how like, a contagion works? If somebody has a cold and you, you, know, you give them a big hug, you're going to get the cold. Uh, somebody has the flu, you, you shake their hand, you might get the flu. Um, it doesn't go the other way around, except with Jesus. Notice this in the Gospels. 
Whenever someone is sick and Jesus touches them, Jesus doesn't get sick, they get well. When someone has leprosy, Jesus touches them, Jesus doesn't become unclean, they become clean. And so the same thing happens with our sin and our shame. Now, when we come near Jesus and we touch him, rather than being condemned and judged, our sin is taken away and is laid upon him. It doesn't just go away, but he bears it on the cross. And so we receive the forgiveness of sins through the death of Jesus Christ. And we receive the righteousness of Christ.